Hello everyone. Chapter 9 is a lot of fun. Everything we cover in Chapter 9 are things that you worry about in the real world all the time. I think you'll enjoy this chapter. So we'll spend some time talking about the ups and downs of the business cycle, how to calculate unemployment and the effects of unemployment, how to calculate inflation and the effects of inflation. So the business cycle, just the ups and downs the economy goes through. So we have these four phases of the business cycle. The peak is a temporary maximum of the economy where everything's going great. And then inevitably, we're going to slide down off of that peak and come down into a recession. A recession is defined as two consecutive quarters decline in GDP. That's kind of a soft definition. That's, that's how your textbook author defines it. Um, other economists are quick to, to label a recession, maybe even before that six months, two consecutive quarters. Um, but generally, we're always going to speak of a recession as a decline in GDP. We learned how to calculate gross domestic product. When the output of the nation begins to decline, then people start getting laid off. We're going to, we're going to call that phase a recession. Then we'll hit bottom at some point, and that bottom is called a trough. And then things will begin to get better again, and we'll head up into that expansionary phase where more GDP is being produced and more jobs are being created. So this just gives that information to you in graph form. So the vertical axis is just the level of GDP, the level of real output over time. So the growth trend for the United States is always upward over time. So you see the growth trend in the background is an upward sloping line, but we grow by fits and starts. So we have a good time and we're into that expansionary phase and everything seems wonderful. We will get to a peak. We will fall off again into a recession and there'll be a time when we bottom out that recession and hit that trough and start expanding again. There's no set definition for how long any of that will last. When we're down, going down in that recession, think 2007, 2008, 2009, that's a really difficult time period and people say, when will it be over? Are we at the bottom yet? Are we at that trough? Is, are we fixing to recover? And, you really don't know that till you look back in hindsight and see the economy begin to grow again. So this chart just emphasizes the fact that we can't say how deep a recession is going to be or how long it's going to last. So this gives you the recession since 1950. And you'll notice the smallest one is six months because this this textbook author doesn't acknowledge that a recession is a recession unless it's been at least two consecutive quarters, so six months. And then look at the decline in real output. So that's the percentage decline in GDP. So sometimes GDP, I mean, 1960-61, almost 10 months, but the decline in GDP was only 1.1% or 69 and 70. It was only, it was less than 1%, only 0.2. So sometimes that decline is not so significant, but look at the decline in 2007 to 2009. It was a very prolonged recession and GDP fell 4%. That's a significant decline. So what causes those ups and downs? What, what's causing that, that problem? So growth is, up and down by nature, but there are some things that precipitate it. We always know that GDP depends upon the level of spending, right? GDP equaled household spending, businesses spending, government spending, and those net exports. So if spending goes down, then GDP is going down. So the question is, what's causing spending to go down? And that has to be analyzed on a case-by-case uh, -case basis as this happens. Sometimes it's some sort of a shock to the economy. So it could be like we looked at in the 70s when we were having the oil crisis. So if oil prices go significantly down, or in this case, significantly up, then that affects our economy as a whole and will be a shock to the economy. Um, in COVID-19, we saw the whole world have an issue. And so certainly the United States economy had a tremendous downturn while, while all that has to be dealt with. 
So we know that, I'm so sorry about that. We know that GDP depends on spending and we're just gonna have to trace what's going on in that spending change. So it could be something that's happening as a political event. It's real common that we have um, a recession when a new president is, inaugur is inaugurated, especially that lame duck time between uh, the election in November and when there's a turnover in the presidency to the following January. It's a, it's a very a time of uncertainty, so that can cause a recession. So financial instability or monetary policy problems, things that have to do with the stock market or what the Federal Reserve is doing with the money supply. Innovation is a really interesting one. When we see big surges upward in the economy, sometimes we can look back and see what technology change did we have? I know that you can't envision a world without personal computers. I'm, I'm old, so I lived in that world. Personal computers had such a huge effect on our economy and a huge push out to our production possibilities curve and caused a great deal of expansion. The internet in the 90s did the same thing. So sometimes we can look back and see that it was some sort of innovation or productivity changes. Sometimes productivity changes for the good. Sometimes it changes for the bad. It depends on what's going on and what's causing it. Cyclical impact. So let's think about what's most affected in the economy by a recession. So if we have a downturn in the economy, we're down into this recession phase. So GDP is going down and people are losing their jobs. Which, which um, industries will be most affected? It kind of matters to you if you think about what industry you're working in and whether you're in an industry that's going to be hard hit by a recession or maybe one that's more protected. It turns out that capital goods are much more affected than our consumer goods because capital goods can be postponed and consumer durables can be postponed. But non-consumer goods, so just normal things like our groceries and our electricity and the doctor's bill, we can't postpone those things. So those kinds of industries are much less affected by a recession than anything that can be postponed. So as far as consumer durables, if our car breaks down and it's in a recession and we get worried about our job, well, we don't go right out and buy a new car. We probably repair that car. So if you're working in the automotive industry of repairing cars, then you're going to do well in a recession because people are going to spend more time. In the community college industry, the community college enrollment tends to go up in times of recession because as people begin to lose their jobs, they think about retraining and preparing for different career fields, and that makes our enrollment go up. So some Industries are fairly protected in times of recession and some are hard hit. So now we're gonna turn our attention to calculating and understanding the unemployment rate. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics is the agency within the Department of Labor who's responsible for calculating and reporting our unemployment rate. Some people think this is done from the number of people applying for unemployment benefits, but that's not true. The unemployment rate is calculated by taking a random survey, this is the Bureau of Labor Statistics doing this survey, of 60,000 households nationwide. I've never been in the survey. You probably haven't been either. But that's the way the unemployment rate is calculated. It has nothing to do with the number of people who are applying for unemployment benefits because a lot of people are unemployed that don't qualify for unemployment benefits and a lot of people are receiving unemployment benefits and while they have to say they're looking for a job, they might not really be looking for a job. To be unemployed, you have to be actively seeking work. You have to be actively seeking work. So I want you to think about the number of people in the population who don't have jobs and they're not looking for jobs. So this graphic help us, helps us understand that. So we have a total population of 328.2 million as of someday in 2018. 
And of those people, the purple category, some of them are children or they're institutionalized in jail or whatever the situation might be, where they're not able, they're not available for work. So we have this purple popula population, 69.5 million. Those people are not available for work. Then we have the orange color that are available, they could, they could work, but they don't choose to work. They don't choose to work. So the not in the labor force, those that 95.6 million, think about them being retired people or independently wealthy. Think about it being full-time caregivers at home, or they could be a full-time student. There's a variety of people that just aren't choosing to work at this particular time. So they're not in our labor force. So to be calculated as unemployed, you have to be part of the labor force. So the labor force is the people that have a job, they're employed, and if you have a job at all, you're counted as employed. So this could be part-time workers, it could be full-time workers, any people who are looking for a job at all, even part-time workers, are counted as employed. You might want a full-time job, but if you have a job at all, you're counted as employed. So this is both of those things are already counted in this category. Plus, to be in the labor force, there are some people who are looking for a job, they want a job, they're actively seeking work, but they don't have a job. So they're also counted in the labor force. So these people are in the labor force and the employed people are in the labor force. So these are the two categories that we use for the denominator of the fraction to calculate an employment rate, okay? So of the 328.2 million, only 163.2 million are actually in the labor force. So that's the denominator of our fraction. The number of people unemployed will always be given to you. So you will always have the number of people unemployed to put up here in the top part of the fraction. The problem when you're working these problems is figuring out the labor force. So remember, if you are given a number for employed and you're given a number for unemployed, this is a super easy problem. Add those two together, that's labor force in the denominator, put the unemployed people in the numerator, Divide the two, we multiply times 100 because we want, to, we want to report the unemployment rate as a percentage. So there are some criticisms of the unemployment rate. I told you if you are working at all, you are counted as employed. But think about somebody who is working but they're working part-time, but they're desperately looking for a full-time job. They feel unemployed, but because they're working and getting paid, they're counted as employed. That causes our unemployment rate to be understated, meaning there's probably more people who feel very unemployed but aren't being counted as unemployed. Let's think about what the definition of a discouraged worker is. So a discouraged worker is somebody who wants a job and they were looking in the past, they were looking really hard for a job, but for whatever reason, they became discouraged and they're no longer looking for a job. Well, if they're no longer looking for a job, they have fallen into that not in the labor force category, that orange one on the prior uh, graphic. They're not looking for a job anymore. They're discouraged. They were hoping to get a job, but they didn't, and they gave up looking. Remember, the definition of unemployed is actively seeking work. So if this person is no longer actively seeking work, they're not going to get counted in the unemployment rate because they're not in the labor force. They have fallen into that not in the labor force category. So they feel unemployed, but they're not being counted as unemployed. So because there's part-time workers wishing they had a full-time job, and because there's discouraged workers wishing they had a job but they're not looking, our unemployment rate may always be slightly understated, meaning it might not count everybody who feels unemployed. 
So our next task, it, task is to figure out what kind or category of unemployment do those unemployed people fall in. So in the graphic that we looked at, there were 6.3 million people unemployed. Some of, some of them were frictionally unemployed, some structural, some cyclical. And we want to know which category they fall in because if we understand that, we can help those people find jobs or we can help tweak the economy where more jobs are available for those people. Two kinds of unemployment of these three are always considered good and one is always considered bad. So frictional and structural are considered good because we can fix them and because they're usually signs of our economy moving forward, a healthy economy. Cyclical employment is always bad. Cyclical unemployment is because of a downturn in the economy, that recessionary phase of the business cycle. People, you hear the word cycle and cyclical. People are losing their jobs because we're not producing as much GDP, not producing as much gross domestic product, so they're being laid off because of that downturn in the economy. That's always bad. We, we, try, to try, we try hard to um, avoid that and get the economy stimulated again. The other two, let's talk about frictional. So frictional is really short-term short unemployment. It's just people moving between jobs. So you're frictionally unemployed if you leave your job because you think you'll be able to get a better one in, in a short amount of time and you're just um, reaching for that next job. It might be, um, you were living in Fort Worth, but working in Dallas, and that gets old pretty quick. You left that job because you're going to full-time search here in Fort Worth for a job. And so you're better in your situation. That's usually very short-term. That's good for the person. It's good for the economy. Everything's moving forward. Structural unemployment is a little harder to understand, and I want to spend some time trying to uh, describe structural unemployment. So when you hear structural, the first thing to think about is probably a mismatch between the skills that the people who are looking for the jobs have and the skills that are needed for the available jobs. We had a lot of problems with that. Um, oh goodness, I was gonna give you the exact years. Um, 2017, 2018 is my memory, where there were so many jobs available, but there were a lot of people still unemployed. And you think, why do we have so many un people unemployed when there's so many jobs available? And the problem was, there just wasn't a match. The, the jobs that were available needed specific skills that the people who were looking for those jobs just didn't have. So that's structural unemployment. We can fix that. Why we consider it to be good is our economy is moving forward and different skills are being needed. So that's a good thing. And what we need to do is to provide the training that those people need to get those skills to move into those jobs. And, and that's something that we can do. So now we're going to try to differentiate what we mean by full employment. We never mean zero unemployment as full employment. I know it sounds like that's what full employment would be, the zero unemployment, but that's not true. We say we're fully employed when we have zero cyclical unemployment. No one unemployed because of the downturn in the economy. So that means if we were fully employed, we would still have frictional and structural unemployment. So that's how we're going to define the natural rate of unemployment. So the natural rate of unemployment is when we only have frictional and structural. So that means full employment and natural rate of unemployment really mean the same thing. We just have frictional and structural. So the actual unemployment rate could be greater 
than the natural rate because we had some cyclical unemployment. That makes sense. But the natural rate of unemployment can actually be less than the natural rate of unemployment. And we'll, we'll look at that in some more detail. So when we think about what unemployment is and what its cost is to society, we need to think about this concept of a GDP gap. So if we have people that are unemployed, remember they're actively seeking work, they want to work, but we, they can't find jobs. Can you theorize in your mind whatever skills those people might have, they would be producing GDP, some good or service for the economy, but they're not because they can't find a job. So the, the economic cost of unemployment is the amount of GDP that did not get produced because those people were not, were not working throughout looking for a job. So the GDP gap represents the GDP that did not get produced by those people who are unemployed, who, do, who were not participating. So GDP equals the actual GDP gap, I'm sorry, equals the actual GDP, well, how much GDP did we make, minus the potential GDP. What, how much GDP could we have made if those people who were unemployed had been working and had full-time jobs? So that GDP gap can be negative or positive, just like we said that the actual unemployment rate can be above or below the natural rate. So when we have cyclical unemployment, think about that for a minute, when we have cyclical unemployment, then we could have produced more than we did. So the potential GDP is greater than the actual GDP. So when we subtract actual minus potential and potential is a bigger number, then the GDP gap is going to be negative. So anytime we have cyclical unemployment, we know we're going to have a negative GDP gap. So a man named Arthur Oaken was a British economist and he quantified a way for us to estimate this GDP gap and what it would, what it would approach, what numbers it would approach. He says for every 1% of cyclical unemployment, we'll get a 2% GDP gap. So I want you to think about this for a minute. For every 1% of cyclical, we'll get a 2% GDP gap. So let's say, let me see if I can write on the slide. Let's say that actual unemployment, I know I'm so slow. Let's say that actual unemployment equals 10%. Just once I'll try to draw the percentage sign here just for fun. All right, actual unemployment is 10%, but let's say the natural rate of unemployment, <laughs> the natural rate of unemployment equals um, 5%, okay? So natural rate of unemployment equals 5%. So there we go. So we're gonna subtract the natural rate of unemployment from the actual unemployment to get the amount of cyclical. So this 5% then is cyclical unemployment, okay? Then Arthur Oaken said for every 1% of cyclical would get a 2% GDP gap. So we're gonna multiply this by two. And what we're gonna see is that's gonna give us a 10% GDP gap. I ran out of room on my slide, didn't I? Whoops, that should have been a D. I do that all the time. Do you do that? GDP gap. <laughs> okay, hoping you will forgive that awful hen scratch, but let me read it to you. Actual unemployment, what we actually had was 10%. Natural rate, remember that was frictional and structural, was 5%. So when we subtract that from the actual, what was left over was cyclical, and according to Arthur Oaken, for every 1% of cyclical, we'd get a 2% GDP gap. So we're gonna multiply that by Arthur Oaken's factor of two. Five times two gives us a 10% GDP gap. 
All right, just to make things just really messy here, what if actual unemployment is 6%? I'm going to say this out loud, and then I'll keep writing while you calculate. What if actual unemployment is 6% and natural rate is 4%, what will be the GDP gap? So y'all solve that while I write here. So I said actual unemployment, 6%, natural rate, I said that it was 4%. So how much is cyclical, guys? Because remember, we're subtracting. So cyclical is 2. Wish I hadn't made that so long. Cyclical unemployment is 2. Multiplied by what? Arthur Oaken's factor of 2. So we know that the GDP gap then is going to be about 4%. Well, that's pretty. All right, now take that one step further. If you're told the dollar value of GDP is, let's say, $100 million, you can multiply that 4% times the GDP dollar value given. So if it's $100 million times 4%, then there's going to be a $4 million GDP gap. Okay, this is just some visual of some real information. So we've got the actual unemployment here. Let's look at it first on our right. The actual unemployment rate from 1998 to 2018, and we've got the percentage on the vertical axis. So what was happening back in um, 2008, 2009 to cause that really high? Let's do that to cause this really high unemployment rate right here. What's happening right there? Do you remember that was the Great Recession that we've talked about? And then unemployment went down, 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 down for a while. Our data here only goes to 2018. It continued to go down in 2019. Um, we keep looking at that decline. Again, the only data we're talking about goes up to 2019 there. And then let's look at that same thing over here on this chart, and we can track that. So our potential GDP is the red line. The potential GDP is the red line. And the actual GDP is the blue line. So since that was the data we highlighted on the right, let's go back to that 2009 period. And we're seeing all of this area as being a negative GDP gap. So if we have a lot of people unemployed, then there's a lot of GDP not getting produced. So the potential then is much higher, that red line is much higher than what actually got produced. And then we saw GDP, I mean, uh, unemployment rates get very, very small. And they actually, I know you can just barely see it right here, but there was a spot here where the actual GDP was greater than the potential. Well, how can that be? Well, when actual is greater than potential, you've got a really really low unemployment, probably unemployment then is lower than the natural rate, meaning that there are people who are working two jobs and working a lot of overtime, and so a lot more GDP is getting produced than what normally would be able to be produced. So the GDP gap can be positive like here in the blue and just the little bit of blue that was fixing to happen up here, or it can be negative, like this area where we had high unemployment. Anytime we have cyclical unemployment, we're going to have that negative GDP gap. Part of the problem with unemployment is that it doesn't fall equally on all of the population. It depends on what jobs you have. It can be dependent what kind of job, like blue collar or, or uh, white collar. So, Generally, uh, lower skilled jobs have a much greater risk of unemployment. It's dependent on our age. Young people, particularly 
Teens and early 20s have a much higher unemployment rate than older people do. It's dependent on race and ethnicity. Still, it is. Um, I believe Asian unemployment is still the lowest of any kind of unemployment. Uh, Male-female is almost exactly equal these days, so we really don't see that difference anymore. The more years of education, the less likely you are to be unemployed. And then most unemployment is short-term duration, and that's defined as 15 weeks or less. If it's short-term, it's 15 weeks. So then this graphic just gives you um, real data that you can look at. You can look at the 2018 compared to the historical data and um, just get an, inf an, I'm sorry, just an overview of how these different characteristics. So we're doing some better with respect to unemployment differences by race, but we still have a ways to go to get that fixed. Um, do notice that your college degree helps you not to be unemployed. And we don't see much unemployment. Um, we did in, in 2009 in that Great Recession, but historically we don't see much unemployment that's over 15 weeks long. But think about 15 weeks, it's a really long time. So I work in economics and so I'm not a very good sociologist. So this is not something I know a lot about, but we do hear a lot about the non-economic cost of unemployment. Uh, crime goes up, suicides go up, it's very difficult if you've not experienced unemployment in your household when you're doing everything you can to find a job and you can't and it really, um, it's very difficult. It's, it's, um, it reduces a lot of hope. So suicides, homicides, heart attacks, mental illness, these are real problems and they're non-economic costs but they're real cost of unemployment. Our last topic for this um, chapter is inflation. So inflation is defined as an overall rise in the price level, an overall rise in the price level. It's not that all prices are going up, but overall prices are going up. So why is that bad? We think inflation is bad. Why is that? Well, it means that the money that you have, say the amount of money you have doesn't change, but prices go up then your purchasing power has gone down. You can't buy as much stuff. If the amount of money you have is the same, but prices go up, you can't buy as much stuff. So that's the problem with inflation. So the way that we measure inflation is by the consumer price index. It's, a, it's an index that shows the amount of goods and services the typical average consumer purchases. This is a smaller price index than the GDP price index that you calculated back in chapter seven. So the consumer price index is just the things purchased by the typical urban consumer. But it's thought to cover about 87% of all of our population's purchasing power because remember the personal consumption expenditures, the household spending was the largest component of GDP. So CPI is a pretty good estimate of our changes in the price level. So again, it's calculated like it was in the GDP price index. You have the prices of a certain market basket in the specific year divided by that price in the base year. And in the real world, that's a, that's a chained index if you've had your calcula calculus classes. That's a change in chained index from 82 to 84. And then times 100. Don't worry about it. You're not gonna have to calculate the CPI index. I won't hold you account, accountable for calculating it. What I will hold you accountable for is the second formula to calculate the percent change in the inflation rate in the CPI index. So you'll be given CPI index numbers I'm gonna get my pen back up here. So you'll be given a CPI index number in a certain year. So let me label this one as the new number, meaning the most recent number. 
minus the old number, new minus old, divided by the old number. Does that ring a bell to you from things you learned in middle school? The percent change formula is always new minus old divided by old. And then because we report it as an index, again, as a percentage, we multiply it times 100. So you're going to be given these numbers, and all you're going to have to do is take the new one, subtract the old one from it, and divide by the old one. Then you multiply times 100. What this says is that prices went up by 2.4% uh, 2 over this time period. This is just a graphic of our inflation rates in the United States from 1960 to 2018. See how our inflation rates are generally less than 5%. Not that they don't go up. Look what happened in 1980. That was, that was tough. I bought my first house when inflation was way up there like that. It was bad because the interest rate was really, really high. Um, normally, in the United States, our inflation rates stay under 5%. So when you hear about other nations having huge inflation rates, I want you to realize that in the United States, historically, our inflation rates have been less than 5% per year, 5% per year. Remember, this is uh, on an annual basis. So this compares with some other nations. What I really find interesting about this graphic is how intertwined our economies are, how very in, in, interdependent our economies are. So when the United States prices, uh, price level is falling, by the way, price level falling is calling, called deflation, then you see other nations' price levels falling. When our price level begins to go up, other nations' price levels begin to go up and up and down and up and down. And it's just, it's just really interesting um, how very global our world is these days. And we're very, we're very dependent on one another. Okay, so just like we had to identify the different kinds of unemployment, now we have to identify the different kinds of inflation. So we have two kinds of inflation. We have demand pull and cost push. And by kinds of inflation, what I'm saying is what's causing it. Inflation is always prices going up. But what's causing the prices to go up? So demand pull is when our economy is really strong and we're in that expansionary phase of the business cycle and everybody has jobs and we're just spending, 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 spending. And so demand pull inflation is usually said to be caused by excessive spending, too much spending relative to how much we've been able to produce. Something else that can cause demand pull inflation, and this is not really, historically, this has not been as much of a problem for the United States as for other nations, is the central bank issuing too much money. So in our case, our central bank is the Federal Reserve, and if they began to just push more and more currency out into our economy, I know this is not something we studied and we're not going to study it, but if you're interested, you can look up Ir Irving Fisher's quantity of money equation. If you, if you keep putting money out and the quantity of goods and services, the amount of GDP doesn't commensurately go up with it, then you're just causing prices to rise because the amount of goods and services to buy are the same, but you've got more money out there. So you got more money competing for that same level of goods and services and it bids prices up. So that's our demand pull inflation. We need to learn to graph it. It's going to be a rightward shift in the aggregate demand curve. I'll explain that in just a moment. Another kind of inflation or another cause of inflation, I should say, is cost push. So we're still going to see that rise in prices, but it's happening for a different reason. So in cost push, you're thinking from the perspective of the producer, and it's costing, costing the producer more to produce their goods and services. Well, why would that be? Well, their per unit production costs are going up. So inputs, what were inputs? Inputs are the same thing as resources. So our resources were land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability. 
So if we're seeing an increase in the cost of those resources, then we're seeing a decrease in the profitability to the firms and their aggregate supply curves will begin to shift left and that's going to cause an increase in prices. I wanted you to see these graphs even though you're not really ready to see them because we've talked about supply and demand curves, which these look like, but we haven't talked about aggregate supply and aggregate demand. Aggregate supply and av aggregate demand is simply a matter of the supply curves of everything we produce in GDP added together into one supply curve and the supply curve of everything, I mean the demand curve of everything we produce added together into one demand curve. So think of it as the supply being the supply of all GDP and the demand being the demand for all GDP. I just wanted you to see the difference between cost push and demand pull. So the graph on the left that's cost push Notice the short run aggregate supply curve one, the initial one, shifts to the left to the short run aggregate supply curve two. So when that happens and your aggregate demand curve doesn't change, notice that the price level went up. So in cost push inflation, price level goes up. We knew that would happen because it's inflation, right? But also notice what happened to GDP. So Y1 on the um, horizontal GDP axis, where it's listed as Y1, is the level of GDP that we were at to begin with. But when we had that cost push inflation, that general rise in prices because of the increase in the per unit production costs, the resource prices went up, that caused producers to produce left and shift that aggregate supply curve to the left, and that caused prices to go up, but it caused GDP to go down. Can you see that that's a double whammy? You're now paying more for stuff, prices have gone up, but GDP's going down, that means some people are losing their jobs. So we're having this increase in unemployment, decrease in GDP, we're headed down into a recession at the same time that prices go up. That's a double whammy. Reagan called that um, stagflation. The graph on the right is demand pull inflation. Remember demand pull, we said that's excessive demand for goods and services. So this time our aggregate supply curve, that short run aggregate supply, isn't shifting, but the aggregate demand curve is shifting to the right. So we start with 81, so we're at price level one and we're at real GDP, Y1, the demand curve shifts to the right. Net, that caused prices to go up. So we were at uh, average price level two. So prices went up, general rise in prices. We knew they would, demand pull inflation. Prices were going up. But at the same time, GDP is also going up. So we're producing more. That's a good thing. So demand pull inflation is not as harmful to the economy as cost push inflation is, because cost push inflation, not only do we have a rise in prices, we have a decline in GDP. It's difficult to distinguish. When we just see that prices are going up, we might not know why, but it's important that we know why so that we can, if the government's gonna act to try to fix it, that they're fixing it from the right perspective, or they could make it worse. Core inflation is inflation that's measured that doesn't include the price changes of food and energy, um, electricity costs or gas costs, energy costs. So food and energy costs are very volatile. They go up and down and up and down depending on what OPEC is doing or depending on what the weather is doing with food. So if you take those two, those two industries out, when you're calculating the CPI, then you'll get a more stable reflection of what's actually happening in the economy. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the effect of inflation on our income levels. So when we talk about nominal income, that just talks about the amount of money that we make. So when we open our paychecks or we open our bank statement and we see how much the uh, companies that we work for have deposited in our accounts, that's our nominal income. 
But our real income talks about how much we can purchase with our nominal income, our purchasing power. So think about going to work today and your boss uh, tells you that he's very pleased with all that you do and he's um, wanting to reward you. He's going to give you a 5% raise. So your nominal income is gonna go up by 5%. Woohoo, that's great. So you call your mom on, your, on the way home and you tell her how excited because you call your mom when things go bad. You should call your mom when things go great. So you call your mom and you say, I'm going to get a raise. I got a 5% raise today. Oh my goodness, honey, that's wonderful. But then you turn on the radio and you hear the report that says the inflation rate this past year is 7%. So inflation goes up by 7% and your income goes up by 5%. What actually happens to your real income, to your pur uh, purchasing power? Well, your real income would have gone down by 2%, right? Inflation went up by 7. You got a 5% increase. That means you're yay for getting the 5% increase, so your purchasing power didn't go down by 7, but it's still going to go down by 2%. We don't need to spend a lot of time here. Who's hurt by inflation? So think about somebody who receives the same amount of income every month, every year, year after year after year after year, like a pension receiver. It's not a Social Security, somebody who's dependent on Social Security because Social Security benefits are indexed to the CPI index. So, um, when prices go up, Social Security benefits go up. But if you were actually on a fixed pension from a company and you got that same amount every month, well, when prices go up, then, then they're certainly hurt. Anybody that saves money, like if you're just gonna put money in a coffee can in your closet, when inflation goes up, then the money you have in your coffee can is not going to buy as much, so you're hurt. It's interesting that a borrower might not be hurt. A borrower might be helped. So we talked about uh, Social Security recipients being indexed to uh, the CPI. COLA stands for Cost of Living Adjustments. So Social Security recipients get that cost of living adjustment. A lot of union members, like uh, again, if any of your families work at Lockheed, where there's a strong union, and then when they negotiate a contract for five years for various um, worker levels of workers, they'll negotiate that with a cost of living index in it so that when inflation goes up, so do their wages go up so that they're not actually um, hurt by inflation. We said debtors, people who borrow money might be benefited and that's because when you borrow the money, it bought more than if we had inflation than it did when you paid it back. So it's always harder to recover from unanticipated inflation. We can mitigate the effects of inflation if we can plan ahead for it. So people who loan money out like banks or savings and loans or credit unions build in an inflation premium to the interest rate that they charge to cover the effects of anticipated inflation. So your real interest rate has two components. Your real interest rate has the nominal interest rate, just how much um, increase in the revenue of the firm that was making you that loan, how much they wanted to actually be paid for making the loan, that's the nominal interest rate. Then they add an inflation premium to get the total real interest rate. And that's just represented graphically here. So if you even look at your credit card statement, it will, it will report your interest rate as the nominal interest rate. And that nominal interest rate has two components, the real interest rate, how much that creditor actually wanted to make from making you that loan, plus what they anticipated that the inflation rate was gonna be. So if you wanted to solve for real interest rate, what could you do? Well, you could take nominal and subtract the inflation premium and that would give you the real interest rate. 
Sometimes prices don't go up. Sometimes prices go down. If that's the case, we have deflation. Prices going down is deflation. And you think, oh, woohoo, it's deflation. Prices are going down, but it's not usually a woohoo because one of the prices that go down in deflation is the price of labor, i.e. wages. So in deflation, incomes usually uh, fall. They could rise, but that's not usually the case. So remember, we did this in that slide that we uh, looked at the graphs of cost push and demand pull inflation. So cost push inflation caused, when we, when we shifted that aggregate supply curve to the left, that showed us that GDP was going down. So real output is going down. So total national income is going to be going down. We're going to be headed into a recession. Uh, demand pull inflation didn't have that effect. Demand pull inflation, when we increase the aggregate demand curve, we saw an increase in GDP as well as prices. So there are some people that think that zero inflation is best, but many people believe that a small amount of inflation is necessary in order to be able to let our economy grow. But we never want hyperinflation. So we looked at our uh, historical inflation charts, and yes, we've seen inflation go up 10, 13 percent. Most of the time, our inflation rates are less than 5 percent. So hyperinflation is extraordinarily rapid inflation. So this is a real problem. We looked at Venezuela, uh, I don't know, was it after chapter one, I think, where they had one point or was it 13? 13.1% billion percent, 13.1 billion percent, not 5%, where their currency just begins to be completely worthless. You'd have to have wheelbarrows of currency to get a loaf of bread. That's, that's hyperinflation. But on a lesser scale, certainly Germany after World War I, the funny story I'd read about Germany after World War I and how they defined hyperinflation, the price of hyperinflation was having to drink warm beer because as you walked into the pub to order your supper and you had the, the beer to go with it, the prices were going up all night long. So they would keep scratching out the prices on the chalkboard where the prices were written and the beer would go up all night long. So you ordered your food once, so that price was set, but you might want a second beer, but you'd have to order it at the same time you ordered your first one because the price was gonna go up. So the price of inflation or hyperinflation was having to drink warm beer. Uh, you can remember World War I Germany from your history classes, but the causation of that, just the printing of the currency to try to pay those huge war debts that they were in. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the inflation chapter, uh, along with the unemployment and the business cycles. I think this is a really fun chapter. Forgot this slide, did I? Okay, so the last slide in the chapter is really describing structural unemployment. You know, I told you those last words are always kind of fun to read. Anytime we have a skill mismatch between the jobs that are available and the jobs that the job seekers have, we're gonna have structural unemployment. So this is really difficult and it's, um, hard to solve, but it's possible. We just have to get people the training that they need to get those skills matching the available jobs.